Adventure games. Arguably one of the most important advances in video game development, taking us from the simplicity of shooter, action, and platformer games to experiences where we had to let go of the joystick or keyboard for a moment and use a skill other than reflexes and hand-eye coordination. Our minds. They originated in the 70s and early 80s, with the text-based adventures of Zork on the computer and the classic Atari title Adventure, offering some of the earliest story-driven gaming experiences ever enjoyed in an industry dominated by arcade games. Just about every game today has implemented aspects from the adventure game genre, yet despite their consumer and critical praise and industry-wide influence, pure adventure games have struggled historically to find a mainstream audience. Though the genre term adventure has fallen into disuse and may sound generic, there are key design pillars that made these games stand out, despite their evolving presentation. An emphasis on puzzles and a tightly crafted narrative and story, often flush with dialogue as well as mechanics involving the collection of items, then combining or using them to progress to the next challenge, with little combat or none at all. The late 80s saw the genre's transition to a more graphical presentation, and what is now known as the point-and-click adventure game was born. Classics like Maniac Mansion and The Secret of Monkey Island inspired audiences around the world to solve challenging brain teasers and embark on fantastic journeys. The early 90s continued this evolution, and as real-time 3D technology improved, a new iteration of adventure games debuted. 1992's Alone in the Dark popularized the tank control style of gameplay, a beloved classic, which spawned survival horror tropes that many games would imitate. It was unlike anything out there at the time, evocative static camera angles that would shift as you walk around the environment, shot like a stylish movie. It featured a haunting, Lovecraftian tale set in a decrepit mansion full of secrets and horrors, and in spite of its primitive polygonal models, a sense of fear and atmosphere lurked around every corner, and was a major inspiration to the most popular example of the style, Resident Evil. The combination of slower, more realistic movement and stationary camera use was a shoe-in for the claustrophobic anxiety present in these types of horror games. Even bleeding-edge consumer hardware could only render a handful of polygons at a time, so this was an excellent example of how technological limitations inspired style. Static, pre-drawn, or pre-3D rendered backgrounds used far less resources to compute compared to a real-time 3D world. Before the AAA game development industry came into 10, 50, or sometimes over $100 million budgets and the return on investment they demanded, there was a period which saw the creation of high-quality but niche PC games that equaled anything else on the market in terms of quality, with a curious amount of adventure and puzzle games coming out of France. In this fascinating chapter of game development, burgeoning French studio Callisto Entertainment started creating their first high-profile computer game. And though obscure now, it set forth an unforgettable experience through the post-apocalyptic adventure of Dark Earth. Atriate Concept was a startup game development studio, founded by a young, ambitious business school dropout, Nicolas Goum, in Bordeaux, France. A local journalist, Guillaume Le Penic, was covering video games in the early 1990s, when he reviewed Alone in the Dark. Guillaume fell in love with the groundbreaking adventure survival horror game, and today maintains it as a masterpiece of game design. As these two paths crossed, Atriate hired Guillaume on as a designer and writer for their studio, and as smaller game projects were launched, they got the attention of Mindscape, a larger, international developer and publisher headquartered in California. For three years, they worked under their new owners as Mindscape Bordeaux, and created some arcade, racing, and platformer games before founder and CEO Nicolas Goum bought back the company from Mindscape, as the two were in disagreement in the direction they were heading. Goom's company was then renamed again to Callisto Entertainment. Ever since playing it in 1992, Guillaume Le Penic wanted to create a game like Alone in the Dark, and so in the mid-1990s, the next handful of years were dedicated to developing a bible of sorts that would eventually become the foundation for an ambitious transmedia franchise, Dark Earth. Starting with the video game, 1997's Dark Earth is a post-apocalyptic adventure set in a world destroyed by an astronomical disaster. 
which nearly destroyed life on Earth and shrouded the world in a blanket of dust and darkness, those who survived the Great Cataclysm came upon one of the few remaining vestiges of sunlight and constructed a multi-tiered city like Stalite, Sparta, the salvation of civilization. And this captivating atmosphere and plot is echoed throughout every corner of the game world. Sun God, bless me with your rays. In this bright oasis in a world of darkness, sunlight is literally worshipped. Every aspect of society revolves around the light and is governed by the Sunseers, the anointed priests and leaders of the New World. Each caste in the society is delegated to different levels of the Stalite. The lower section is mostly inhabited by the Scavengers, including the protagonist's secret girlfriend, Kali, and the quirky tinkerer, Denrys. The upper sector houses the Guardians of Fire, the Law Enforcers and Guards of the Stalite, as well as the Master Builder, the Master Oiler, the Healers, the Sunseers, and other upper-class inhabitants. Even when it comes down to saving your game, you will need to find a sun god symbol and pray to them to bless you with their rays. Just another way the brilliant environmental design and writing slowly reveal more of the setting and atmosphere to the player. You really get a sense of a working world, with every nook and cranny filled with gizmos, tools, scrap, and refuse that speak to a well-thought-out and compelling setting. The Master Oiler's office is entangled with pipes, tanks, and chemicals. Abandoned projects litter Denry's home. Vehicles to traverse the Darklands adorn the halls of the Guardians of Fire barracks, and books, ancient artifacts, and symbols articulate the Temple of the Sun God, with readable panels depicting the history of Sparta. Even the intended use of artifacts from before, the time preceding the apocalypse, are misinterpreted after a 300-year Dark Age. A stack of compact discs are mistaken for mirrors as an example, and the subtle hints at what happened and investigating the remnants of past civilization spark burning questions that the game tantalizes you to find their answers. There's a kind of a slot in the casing. No. No one else could do it, and I can't do it either. No one's ever opened this door. The game puts you in the shoes of one Arkin, a member of the Guardians of Fire, awakening from a disturbing dream. He is already late for his post, but at this point there are already several optional avenues you can take. You can go upstairs for training and get a handle on the combat system. You can explore the various rooms of the barracks, or you can report to the leader of the Guardians, Provost Dorkin, for orders. Ah, Arkan, it's you. Provost Dorkin, I'm sorry, I, I, I was, uh... Save your arrogance and your lame excuses. I'm not in the mood. Early in the story, Arkan is poisoned by the Shankar Archessence while defending a Sunseer during an attempted assassination. Though the leader of the Sunseer survived the attempt thanks to his efforts, Arkan is now cursed with the black rot running through his veins, slowly transforming him into what his own order fear most, a creature of darkness. One of the beasts that now roam in the post-apocalyptic lands surrounding Sparta. Gameplay is immediately familiar to players of fellow tank control games like Grim Fandango, with a standard action button and a dedicated combat stance like Resident Evil. You can swipe in multiple directions to perform different moves with your equipped weapon, a near-identical control scheme to Lord of the Dark, but it has been refined and doesn't feel as sluggish or unresponsive as the classic game that inspired it. Though Dark Earth isn't strictly speaking a horror or an action game, rather it's a dark fantasy post-apocalyptic adventure, though it does share the brutally tough combat of its survival horror cousins. Some fights will have you outnumbered and beaten to a pulp, with few ways to restore health other than slowly over time. It can feel constrictive or unfair in tight corridors, but I find myself cursing the enemies and my own lack of skill rather than the game, most of the time. The game does have an auto-combat feature, likely to accommodate people more interested in playing the adventure game of Dark Earth rather than its action survival side. It's a shame that auto-combat seems to be nothing more than a seemingly random button-mashing feature, which will only get you through the most trivial of battles, defeating its purpose. Dark Earth's controls may be unintuitive to some players, as many games nowadays let you turn your behind-the-shoulder camera with your mouse or controller, but it's no worse executed than the best examples of the classic adventure genre. Punishing difficulty and the control scheme were the main sticking points reviewers had at the time, ironic as many games now are praised for their difficulty. If you're observant though, and you make sure to collect as many items and weapons you can get your cursed mitts on, you can tip the odds to your favor and occasionally avoid some fights altogether. It's the absolute investment in the game setting that gripped me, with masterclass world building and little hints to lore in every scene. From friendly greetings like Light Be With You, to curses like Blasted Gloom, there are subtle implications that in this photon-deprived world, the absence of sunlight is the worst thing you could imagine. 
and even influences the slang and language the inhabitants of Sparta use. Light be with you, Archivist. I'm Arkan, son of Sunseer Sadar. Blasted gloom, he almost slit my throat. He wasn't human anymore. He was a creature of darkness. There are countless little details that show the love and dedication Callisto had to the world they shared with us. Birds fly about and let out a reverberating squawk. Rats scurry around the scummier places and will congregate around fresh corpses. Your scavenger friend Danries will sometimes be working on a project at his shop when you swing by, often resulting in him having to turn off his grinding wheel before chatting. I can't hear you. Let me turn off the grinding wheel. Mostly solid voice acting and writing pervade throughout. Especially impressive coming from a game translated from French, considering the cheese most game dialogue was in the mid-90s. And compared to Resident Evil a year prior, this sounds like Shakespeare. Richard, what happened? Oh, Jill, this house is dangerous. There are terrible demons. Ouch! With a cast of memorable characters, it's a good sign of story quality when I could name a handful of them and describe their personality while not having played the game for two decades. Particular praise should be placed on the voice work for the protagonist, in the English version, performed by David Gassman, who goes through many variations of his voice, all which sound quite different and fit the state he's in. He has a healthy voice, but it changes tone and timbre when contaminated, and changes again if he further transforms into his more monstrous form. And to top that off, there are pleasant and cruel responses available in each of these three states. It's not often that an actor is hired to perform six different versions of the same character. My father and Lori, the great sunseer, with their heads together. They looked like they were pretty worried about something. So, Master Euler, too busy to talk? Kali, don't panic. Listen, I had to go to the hospital. Quit yelling! It's me, Arkan! Hey, 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 calm down! I couldn't find Thanandar. The story has an interesting arc with some endearing allies and well-acted but ham-fisted villains. There are some twists that are a little too strongly telegraphed, but the game has enough turns to keep it interesting. And I'm not sure if it's the 1990s era computer graphics, the fact that cutscenes were synced to French then dubbed in English afterward, or the stirring audio design. But the CG cinematics in this game have a strange, unsettling feel to them. Cutting edge for 1997, though obviously dated now, I remember playing it on launch and having a churn in my gut whenever a cutscene started, as I knew I was in for something unexpected. Some potent, nightmare feel moments will likely stick with you for years. <laughs> Superficially, Dark Earth looks like a cut-and-dry adventure game with a splash of action and survival elements, but with an engrossing setting and deeper mechanics and scenario design at play under the surface, you begin to see just how innovative and ambitious this game was for the time. In spite of frequent references to the dark and the light, Dark Earth thrusts you into a world of the morally grey. In an interesting design choice that removed dialogue windows with a handful of options, like many adventure games, the element of choice in conversation is instead replaced with two moods, which you can switch between at any time, light and dark. This affects the tone of your dialogue and the reactions your character has when interacting with objects. Light Arcan will open doors casually, and will try to plead and calm people down with reason or persuasion. Moldar, I'm begging you. Okay, go on in. Whereas Dark Arcan will kick open doors, yell at citizens and guards, threaten, or generally abuse people. Get the hell out of my way or I'll blow your brains all over this door! Combined with the open environments of the Stalite, the result is branching story paths, with cinematics and dramatic story moments unique to each of them. Sometimes a firmer hand can open another route through the storyline, and on one or two occasions, the game even predicts the player will get frustrated at a specific character, and built in a response to attacking or growling at them as a way to snap them out of their initial refusal to help. Alternatives to the obvious path abound, bribing guards with a flask of stole to avoid a combat encounter, or bringing a shiny object to a dancer to convince her to put in a word with a contact, or even going back to question an NPC a few times to learn of their treachery a different way than the usual one, whilst avoiding one of the toughest fights in the game. This is a peek into next-level game design, where the game doesn't simply pause with a binary moral decision screen whenever there is a fork in the game's storyline, literally pointing the player to choose option A or option B, 
Instead, Dark Earth provides tools to use, and each player's individual behavior governs the outcome, making those choices invisible and immersive, without even informing the player that they've ticked a narrative box at all. Arcan is feared and even attacked by the more superstitious inhabitants of the Stalite, but if you're cautious and try to explain yourself to them, you can avoid several fights with guards. If you run around or act too recklessly though, you'll have a lot more combat on your hands. This is one area where Dark Earth innovates and distances itself from common adventure games. The freedom of choice. You can kill just about any character in the game world, friend or foe. Over half the NPCs could die and the story would continue on. There are a couple key characters though that if you end their lives, you'll be met with an assassin or guard killing you in the next scene. Disappointing, but understandable, as it would be a nightmare web of dynamic storytelling if you could remove X, Y, and Z characters and somehow, the adventure would go on without a hitch. There are even optional sequences that could be completely missed by the unwary, like sneaking under the stalet walls and exploring a part of the outside. It's a brief but captivating glimpse into the world that begs to be further examined. A notable distinction from many other games is the thematic scarcity of firearms. In this neo-dark age, there are few guns, but they are very powerful, often suddenly ending difficult fights in short order. <laughs> Ammunition is scarce. You either find bullets hidden in a crevice, or have to forge rounds for your spit rod. If you're observant, and find enough supplies and the crafting room, some guns have only two or three bullets available in the entire game, creating a sort of mystique and ominous nature to them, and are much deadlier than the blades, axes, and spears of which most combat is fought with. Some of these artifacts are from the mysterious before, and are the most sought-after treasures in the game. Arguably the most interesting and unique game mechanic Dark Earth has to offer, is the way it tries to corrupt the player through temptation. There are few methods of reversing the black rot, once infected, and those are later in the story. There is an ever-present gauge on the screen that shows you how far progressed this affliction has become, doubling as a time limit and a resource meter. You see, you can utilize your corrupted form in supernaturally strong attacks, which deal significantly more damage. Useful in a game with punishing combat like this one. The catch? Every time you use a power attack, the meter drains more. Around the halfway mark, if you don't find relief, you will permanently transform further into a creature of darkness. In this even more monstrous form, NPCs who are on the fence about your appearance will react aggressively and may attack you even if they hadn't before, and every single line of dialogue you utter will be affected by this new form. It's a fascinating study of how far Callista went with the story and setting, that they'd create so many reactions and dialogue lines for what could be considered an unnecessary expenditure of time by the people footing the development pill. You can even go back and read the historical passages on the walls of the Sun God Temple in Arkhan's monster voice, and you'll have a completely different reaction to it. That's dedication to the craft. I always thought this monster was just a legend. After what's happened to me, I've changed my mind. I wonder which I want to be, man or monster. In the years during development, Callisto attempted to bring Dark Earth to other media. A tie-in novel titled The Torch was written, which explores the events immediately following the Great Cataclysm, in addition to the present-day wasteland sadly, never making it to bookstore shelves. In collaboration with French publisher Multisim, a popular tabletop role-playing game was published, with 11 sourcebooks and a complete second edition. The demise of Multisim ended the RPG's run, though a small but loyal French fanbase still hosts meetups about the game, even today. An animated cartoon was being developed, but early iterations saw characters from the video game reused haphazardly, with little of the personality or story function retained, so the collaboration with the external animation studio was ended. What was to be a big-budget television show was in development, with the rights to Dark Earth personally secured by Ridley Scott, but never got off the ground. Even a feature film was in the works, with screen legend Steven Spielberg involved at one point, yet due to complications, was never casted or filmed. Much of this could be credited to the fascinating setting that Guillaume and his team put together for the game, but from the business side, it also showcases CEO Nicolas Goom's ambitions for the company, rubbing elbows with luminaries like Bill Gates, Steven Spielberg, and large corporations like Sony, Apple, and DreamWorks, even convincing some of them to join his management team. But despite a glamorous public face with entertainment and tech big shots attached to it, 
It was a rocky road through much of Callisto's existence. Electronic Arts pulled out of a publishing deal for Dark Earth just months before the game's release, being later picked up by Sid Meier's company, Microprose, who, also struggling at the time, released the game, but to minimal marketing or fanfare, Guillaume also worked on the concept and idea behind Callisto's Nightmare Creatures, a visceral action horror game for the PlayStation, PC, and Nintendo 64, originally releasing in 1987, though only involved in the beginning as he was unable to dedicate much time to it while working on multiple Dark Earth projects. Nightmare Creatures and its disappointing sequel were probably the most successful games Callisto released, selling roughly a million copies total. Callisto also developed two games based on the fifth element, the hit sci-fi movie by fellow French director and screenwriter Luc Besson. The games were poorly received and didn't do much for the company's bottom line. In the end, there was a lot of talent at Callisto, but it seemed like their eclectic projects and poor management ultimately killed the company. They just weren't able to make their killer app, like Bungie's Halo, Blizzard's Warcraft, or id Software's Doom, a necessity to see them through the dreaded dot-com bubble, which ended so many game companies in the early 2000s. This promising developer's luck ran out in their last year of operation, where their stock price dropped 95% after revenue plummeted and a last-ditch effort to refinance was blocked by stock market regulators. This led to bankruptcy and several years of lawsuits in which Nikola Goom and other executives were held accountable for major losses from investors. Nikola was ordered to pay 200,000 euros to stock authorities for violating rules regarding the informing of investors. The company's officials were found without fault after four grueling years in criminal court, though civil suits carried on afterward. Lead designer and director of Dark Earth, Guillaume Le Penic, left shortly before Callista went under in 2002. He was generally dismayed with the direction the company was going, and due to a technicality, was never reimbursed for stock options he was owed, and essentially walked away empty-handed. I reached out to Guillaume for answers to some burning questions I had regarding the game's development, its cancelled sequel, and the surrounding material based on it. We ended up doing an interview, where he revealed fascinating insight behind the scenes of Dark Earth's production. Another version of Dark Earth was in development for the PlayStation 1, which was going to have a different storyline and characters. PC and PSX tech was very different, and often required rebuilding much of the engine or tech behind a game, so this was a fairly common practice. With the looming release of the PlayStation 2, a team at Callisto were working on a sequel called Dark Earth Silent Chaos. After Square took interest in the franchise and signed on as publisher, Guillaume worked on pre-production, and he spoke of an intriguing story and gameplay concept, which involved the protagonist having the Shanker arch essence infecting one arm and the light infused with the other. The sheer amount of possibilities this light-dark gameplay could inspire practically write themselves. Guillaume consulted on the project to make sure it fit the setting and style set by the original, but a different team was put on development. Square brought on Tetsuya Nomura, most known for his character design for the Final Fantasy series, to redesign the characters in Silent Chaos. Many more Japanese fantasy game tropes were introduced as well, like bright, colorful monsters and special effects. This collaboration could have worked. After all, the industrial look and feel of Dark Earth was strikingly similar to the bleak atmosphere of Midgard in Final Fantasy VII that same year. But language barriers and conflicting culture, on top of a rocky relationship between the French developer and the Japanese publisher, led to Silent Chaos's cancellation. More concepts were considered afterward, such as a possible co-op title with two unique playable characters set in the Dark Earth universe. Then a more back-to-basics approach to a sequel was started in 2001. Right as Callista was starting to run into major financial problems, it was a fascinating concept featuring the player as a hunter surviving the Darklands along with his wolf-like beast, inspired by the beloved Studio Ghibli movie Princess Mononoke. This final attempt at a sequel was ended with the closure of Callisto Entertainment in 2002. Guillaume later worked on the 2005 horror title Cold Fear, until development got into the bad habits of many AAA games, overloaded staff, and unusually tight deadlines. When he signed on, the prevention of these problems were promised, but not fulfilled so Guillaume left the project before its completion. Guillaume now works as an independent writer and has done a wide swath of translation work from English to French, ranging from the Elder Scrolls Oblivion to entire novels including works by James Barclay and Jim Butcher. So perhaps the dream of revisiting the imaginative and compelling world of Dark Earth has passed, since the rights to the game's intellectual property is likely tied up in some obscure holding company or legal purgatory. At the time of this video's release, the game is still unavailable to buy in any digital format. But as Guillaume mentioned in our interview, he hasn't yet given up on that world, and even today, still wants to bring it to a new and bigger audience. Though stuck in the notorious development hell, he's still in talks with the director and may be able to secure the rights and budget for a full English feature film set in the Dark Earth universe. Reaching for the sky in an Icarus-like tale, Dark Earth nearly achieved greatness across the gaming world, movies, and television. 
but instead return to the darkness from which it was inspired. Though the future looks bright for long-lost franchises to return, we even witnessed the re-release of System Shock, with a remake and sequel now in development, another discarded franchise caught in legal limbo for over a decade before being brought back to mainstream audiences. I'd like to be optimistic that we'll be able to enjoy the niche but beloved experience of Dark Earth once again. In this gloomy era of cynical monetization and endless retreads of proven but derivative entertainment, new technology and platforms are allowing creators to break the rules and occasionally provide us with the unexpected. There may be hope in the horizon. I appreciate you watching this video. If you haven't noticed, I've been alternating between more obscure games like this one and more mainstream franchises. If you want to see more of this type of coverage, please tell me so in the comments and share this with your friends. It helps to get this out to a wider audience. My heartfelt appreciation goes out to my awesome patrons who help make these videos bigger and higher quality. If you'd like to support my work, please check out my Patreon and consider donating. And as always, thank you for watching.